Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Area of responsibility, DBVOR. The title of our webinar, the topic rather, is adapting DBV case management during the COVID-19 response. My name is Alexina Rusere, Rega, DBV AOR Middle East and North Africa, and I'm with my colleague Pamela Mary Godoy um, uh, from Asia and the Pacific. We will be facilitating uh, the webinar together. As the webinars, I would like to share with you that as the webinars delved into more discussions on how to protect women and girls during COVID-19 pandemic, we felt very much encouraged by the statement of the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who reiterated the agent need to protect women and girls against gender-based violence. Noting that in many countries, the reports of domestic violence have doubled or even tripled due to lockdowns. The Secretary General also urged all governments to put women's first, women's safety first as they respond to the pandemic. And gender-based violence prevention and response must be part of the COVID-19 response. This was very encouraging. Furthermore, the WHO Director General Tedros uh, also called on all countries to include life-saving services to end violence as an essential service that must continue during the COVID-19 response. Again, very encouraging words indeed. And in light of this, we can all see that at the global level, the discussions on how to best adapt interventions are vibrant, yet we should maintain the momentum at our level. In today's webinar, which is focusing on remote GBV case management, we are privileged to have three speakers to support the discussions. And the three are Laura Canal, GBV Technical Advisor, Middle East, I with IMC, Caroline Masbung with UN, um, UA, UNICEF, GBV, IMS. And our third speaker is Dokas Ahinfoa, presenting together with Vivian Koech, who is with the GBV AOR. Dokas is with UNICEF. We shall accord them the opportunity to introduce themselves as they present their sessions. In addition, Vivian Coet Child and Adolescence Survivors Coordinator, who is supporting the CAS initiative, we also present on how we can coordinate and benefit from her expertise when working with child and adolescent survivors in our settings. Our colleagues, Jessica Goram, and Lay Ashley will be monitoring the chat messages as well as your questions for the speakers. We also have our colleagues, our colleague Sarah Martin from the GBV OR community of practice and colleagues from the GBV OR help desk will also be monitoring the chat messages, responding to some of the questions and sharing resources respectively. Similar to the other webinars, we are all here for collective learning, problem solving, adaptation, and innovation, given this unprecedented and rapidly evolving situation. Without further ado, I would like to call upon our first speaker, Laura. Yes. Laura. Hello, everyone. I am Mohammed Al Farouch, professor. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you, Alexina, for the for the introduction. So as Alexina mentioned, uh, I'm Laura Canali, and I'm the 
GBV technical advisor for IMC covering Middle East and North African countries. And in addition, I'm also part of the global GBV IMS technical team. So it's uh, a pleasure for me to be here today and thanks to the AMR and also to the COP for organizing uh, this event. Morning, sorry, we can hear some music. Hmm. Okay, music is gone. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. No, it was not mine, but I'm not sure. But anyway, music is gone. Um, Thank you. Uh, great. So yeah, I, I introduced myself. I'm not sure if I was mute or I'm mute too, but uh, yeah, my name is Laura Canale. We're for IMC and at the same time, I'm part of the GBD IMS technical, global technical team. Um, okay, let's start uh, um, with the first part of the webinar today that as you can see from the PowerPoint is uh, prerequisites to shift uh, service delivery to remote case management. And when we talk about remote case management, we talk about phone case management mainly through phone. Uh, so during the next, uh, this part of the presentation, the next 10 minutes, we will see um, when uh, to consider moving to remote case management. So when we can consider shifting from in-person case management to remote case management, then we will look at what we will need to do to be able to shift to remote case management, and finally, who should provide remote case management. So when, what, and who is the, 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 the things we will cover during this presentation. Uh, next PowerPoint, please. Okay, let's start from when. When considering remote case management. So we are talking about mainly two case scenarios. The first case scenario is when there are no dedicated and confidential places where we can meet the survivor. So as we all know, during this COVID-19 response in many countries, uh, the gathering of people is prohibited, which means that many group activities, if we have women and girls safe spaces, many group activities are not uh, possible anymore, uh, might be suspended, of course. So, however, in some cases, we might still be able to use the space, the women and girls safe spaces, to, um, to keep providing uh, uh, individual support to survivors. So, of course, we need the preventive measures, right? We are talking about infection prevention or measures. I still hear music. Somebody, okay. <laughs> um, so we can still be a. Yeah, I'm muted. We might. Still... I'm muted. No, it's not muted. We are still okay. Thank you very much. Please keep it like this. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, thank you. Or maybe at least shut down the music. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I was trying to say that uh, um, Activities, but we might still be able to use the space to provide individual support to case management, uh, including case management, of course. This, of course, depends on the government restrictions. So it might depend from country to country, but this might be a possibility in some context with the needed preventive measure to avoid uh, um, COVID uh, spreading. So when this space or any other confidential space is not available, so we we cannot use this kind of spaces to provide uh, in-person case management, for example, because movements are restricted and people, including the case worker, might stay home, then we might need to shift to remote case management. This is the first uh, uh, scenario. The second scenario is when there is a space available, but the survivor is not able to physically come to meet the case worker. For example, as we were saying before, the women and girls safe spaces or other spaces might still offer uh, the possibility to provide in-person case management and the case ma our case manager might still be able to reach the place, but the survivors might not be able to come, for example, because there are movement restrictions imposed on population or for any other reasons. Let's not forget that, you know, for many survivors, it's e during 
normal programming, so uh, keeping aside the COVID-19, usually during normal programming, it might be easier to, for survivors to come uh, to the women and girls' spaces and looking for help, you look for case management, even taking the opportunity of the other group activities, right? So while, uh, you know, coming uh, uh, formally to participate to a group activity, they might be able to access case management. But if the group activities are suspended, at that point, of course, it might be anyway difficult for the, for the survivor to come to the women and girls' spaces to receive case management. So if the survivor cannot come to the women and girls' spaces, that's, of course, the other scenario where we can, uh, we might need to, to shift to remote case management. That said, let's keep in mind the remote case management should be provided only if we can guarantee safety and confidentiality for the case workers and for the survivors. So please, let's keep in mind that if the service cannot guarantee safety and confidentiality or might put survivors or the case worker at further risk, the risk is that we will do harm. Therefore, it's better not to implement it. And we will go back to this topic, very important topic later on. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we discussed the when, then let's move to the what. What do we need to do to be able to shift to remote case management? First of all, of course, consult with case workers to discuss the possible modalities. Of course, the case workers are those providing directly the service. So it is important to discuss with them this option and the way of doing it, including any question or concern that they might have. So while discussing modalities, always ensure, of course, as we've just mentioned, that safety and confidentiality of the survivor and of the case workers are a guarantee because this is really important. The second, the second point is decide how to manage current open cases. So we might find ourselves in a situation where, of course, we already have open cases. So at that point, what do we do with these open cases if we shift to remote case management? So we need to consider the different elements. We need to consider the amount of open cases, how many open cases we already have, the number of case workers that will be able to provide remote case management, as we will see later in the WHO session, let's say, not all the case workers might be able to provide remote case management. So how many case workers can keep providing remote case management? The capacity of these case workers, the time they do have to provide remote case management, the different shifts and the location of the case workers providing remote case management. So all these elements need to be kept in mind. So for example, if we have many open cases, we might need to consider, for example, closing those that are almost closed already. Okay, that are almost closed, we might consider closing them and we might consider to prioritize those that are higher risk. Also, do we need to reallocate some open cases to other case workers? As we said, and as we will see, not all case managers might be able to provide remote case management. So, do we need to reallocate some of their cases? In this case, of course, it's mandatory discuss and explain this option with the survivor right and seeking their consent if we are thinking about reallocating the case to another case manager but still it's something we might need to keep in mind third point decide if your organization is able to take on new cases so considering all the elements we discussed so far have we the needed capacity and the needed resources to take on new cases uh, or we just have the capacity to kind of keep providing support to the current cases. So this is an important decision. If we decide to take on new cases, how we are going to decide, uh, how we are going, sorry, to, pro to, to, to support new cases with the use of a hotline, for example. And on a hotline, there is uh, uh, some guidance out there. There is also an, uh, an IRC remote and mobile service delivering guidance note, which includes some guidance on hotline. But this might be an option to, um, to reach out to new cases. Next slide, please. Number four, we need to create an SOP, a standard operating procedure for the case workers on how to provide the service. So the modalities of the service provision will be different because we're talking about remote case management. So we might need to review our SOPs or create the new SOPs for remote case management. And this might include uh, 
details such as uh, from where to provide the service, where is the caseworker when, when he's providing the service, in which days and which time the service is available. This might be different from the normal uh, provision of service. The shifts of the caseworkers on calls. So let's not forget that caseworkers, if the caseworkers are working from home, they also have tasks at home, right? They might have kids to take care of that are not going to school, or they might be busy at home with personal tasks. So they might not be able, be available to work the same amount of hours they were available when, when they are in a women and girls' spaces or in an office because they are at home. So let's try to organize the shifts of the case workers on calls also according to, to this new situation. We might include in the SOP uh, what to focus on during the phone calls for the survivors. And again, we will discuss this and there are, uh, there are guidance uh, out there, including podcasts. How to do safety plan for survivors at risk of IPV while confined at home. Even in this case, this is very important and it's, uh, you know, we will discuss it and there are podcasts specific on this. How to document the case? We are in case workers might be home and not uh, and not in an office. So how to document the case? The modalities of remote supervision, as we all know, supervision of to case management is extremely important. But in this case, again, we are working in a different modalities. So how can we provide remote supervision to case workers, even though in remote, of course? The procedures to close cases and dealing with life-threatening situation, all of these are elements we need to insert in our SOP. Next slide, please. Six, uh, sorry, five, fifth element of the what to do. We need to ensure that the needed supervision and staff care for case workers uh, working from home is provided, again. Supervision and staff care is not something we must, we have to forget during this time. Okay, it might even be more challenging for the case workers to work from home. So they really need support, supervision and staff care. Number six, provide the case worker with the proper orientation on how to provide remote case management. Of course, if we have our SOP that's, you know, giving them the written SOP is definitely helpful, but it's not sufficient. We cannot just provide them with the with the document and said, okay, now go home and provide remote case management. We need to provide them with sessions to discuss the modalities of remote case management and how it, their job change from the in-person case management to remote case management and also allow them, the case worker, to ask questions and discuss concerns they might have. Seven, making sure to procure mobile phones, of course, for the case worker, or at least if we cannot provide mobile phones, at least a SIM card and the needed credit because the case worker might need to call themselves the survivors. They might need to call other service providers. They might need to call the supervisor or other colleagues. And, uh, you know, for um, also for security reason, case workers should not be using their own personal phone numbers to provide case management to survivors. So, if we cannot provide a phone, our, the organization cannot provide a phone for each case worker, at least a SIM card dedicated to, to the work to, case, to provide the remote case management. Eight, update the referral pathway. So, of course, during this period of social distances of movement restrictions, many service providers might have to change their modalities, right? The same way we do it. We, we shift from in-person to remote case management. So, other service providers might also shift and change their modalities of work. They might reduce the staff, or in some cases, they might even close. So we need to update our referral pathway because that might not be uh, updated anymore to the current situation. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so we discussed the when, we discussed the what, and now we have the who. So who, how to determine which of our case worker is able to provide remote case management. So if we are in a situation when it is needed to shift remote case management, we need to try to understand if our case workers, or maybe it's only some of them, are able to provide remote case management. So not all of them might be in a position to do that. Uh, so let's see which kind of element we need to look at to see if or which of our case worker might, will be able to provide remote case management. The first one is the experience. The case worker needs to have a solid experience in GBV case management because uh, GBV case management, 
I mean, remote GBV case management can even be more difficult than in-person one. So we want to make sure that we have a person at home that is, is already experienced in GBV case management. If the person doesn't have previous experience in GBV case management, might not be the best fit. The second element, is the case worker willing and feel comfortable in providing GBV case management in remote from home, for example? Uh, this is something else, you know, forcing them to provide remote case management from home if they don't feel comfortable in doing that, if they don't feel safe, might not be a good option, a good choice. Three, can the organization provide the phone, of course, or a SIM card, as we said before, and the needed credit? So to, for each case manager, we need to be able to provide them at least a SIM card and the credit needed. Four, is the case worker leaving or working from a place where there is a phone, this phone signal? This is a tiny, stupid thing, but it's something we want to see before. There is signal where the case worker is leaving or where the case worker is providing case management. Maybe there is a comp the signal of a company and not of another company. So let's try to understand which company has the strongest signal in that specific uh, location. Finally, fifth point, but very important. Is the case worker able to ensure confidentiality when providing remote case management? So for example, is the case worker working from home? She lives alone or she lives with other family members? Does she have a room in her house or a space nearby where she can go to provide, remote, to provide case management alone to guarantee confidentiality? Does she live in a tent? As we know, if we are living in a tent, confidentiality might be a risk because any person passing by, even the neighbor, might listen to what we are saying. And we are talking about a service that is very sensitive and confidential. So are there the conditions in the house of the caseworker to be able to guarantee confidentiality? We need to discuss this with each single case worker, of course, because for some of them, some of them might be able to do that. Some other might not be able to do that. And that's okay. As we said, if we cannot guarantee confidentiality, we don't want that case worker to start to provide remote case management with uh, relatives, family members, friends, neighbors listening to the session. Um, so that's another important thing. Um, yeah, next slide. Okay, I think, you know, that was, uh, was it. Um, in short, there is a podcast uh, covering, again, this topic on the GBV IMS website in case you want to hear again uh, this presentation. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it in terms of uh, how to decide if we can provide, if we can shift to remote case management. Thank you, Laura. Let's now call on our next speaker to talk about taking a crisis call, what to say and how to say it in the context of remote GBV case management. Hello, everyone. Hey, excuse, uh, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm, excuse me. Who's speaking? Is there yeah, I'm, have I'm a question? A, Could we leave it to the end? I ah, think okay, okay, okay. No, because... Don't worry. Yeah, if that's okay, we have a Q&A at the end um, for 30 minutes. So we're just going to race through the uh, presentations and then we can like talk in depth in case anything comes up to you. And of course, do feel free to like put any pressing questions as we're speaking in the chat box and these will be responded to as well. Okay, so let's just continue. Uh, my name is Dorcas. Um, as has been mentioned already, I work at UNICEF as a senior GBV and emergencies consultant. So today we're really going to focus on the, um, the principles of taking a crisis call, the preparation you have to do, and how doing GBV case management on the phone differs from face-to-face and um, safety considerations and how to end a call. Now this presentation is um, a little bit long. I only have 10 minutes, so I will be skipping over key bits, but it'll be online for you to go through and on the GBV IMS uh, website, as Laura has said, there are like detailed uh, podcasts and more you can see there. 
Next slide, please. So the guiding principles um, in terms of uh, GBV case management on the phone pretty much are similar to what we do face to face. It's just that you have like a much less, um, you have a truncated piece of time. So you have a less time to do um, what you would do face to face, but they follow the same principles. And particularly you're doing what we essentially call crisis counseling. So active listening and the use of empathy statements. So really listening to survivors, trying not to wait to talk is important, but you know this if you do this kind of work. Um, using encouraging words, um, paraphrasing and reflecting, really paraphrasing as we always say is around clarifying what you've heard, particularly on the phone where signal might not be so good. Clarifying is really important. So paraphrasing is important that you do. Summarizing is really showing the survivor that you've understood what they're saying, but it also helps, it serves a technical purpose in the call, particularly when there's like limited time, the survivor might actually be in imminent sense of danger. It's a way to bring a sense of movement to the call. And also empowering in terms of a sense of self-determination is really important, exactly like what we do in face-to-face, -face, it's essentially trying to restore to a survivor a sense of control, reminding them of their own resilience because they have been in this situation before. Yes, services are closed, but they have their own solutions and it's reminding them of what that, those solutions were and having a lot of collaborative problem solving. Silence is key, silence is okay and a key part of active listening. Next slide, please. So just a quick recap in terms of what Laura has said, really. Um, you know, what we need really is to make sure um, caseworkers have access to a private space and a private phone, updated referral pathway of services permitted to operate because not all services are operating, access to police or trusted community support if available for survivors in imminent danger. The reality is though, in a lot of um, our contexts, sometimes yeah. police are not trusted. Um, and so this is not something that you really can um, refer to. So this is something you have to think through quite ethically. A short tip sheet or ideas on how survivors in danger can keep safe. So to have that near the phone while you're having the call is really important. And where services permit. So if you have official permissions and transport to move survivors to safe shelter, if you have that service available and if it's requested. And of course, access to supervisors for support and guidance. Next slide, please. So this slide is taken from the really useful IRC resource on GBV crisis case management. And it shows you the different steps between um, a crisis case management um, process and one that you would do face to face. And if you look closely, the steps are a little bit different. So we have a, a shorter introduction and safety check process um, in terms of um, like assessment that's also quite truncated. And we really focus on really, if you look at it, really immediate and core needs. Next slide, please. So it, in the context of COVID-19, what this really means is that your introductions and consent processes are briefer. So survivors may have very limited time to speak safely, or they might be at imminent risk of harm. So your introduction should really try, try not to keep it to five, not more than five minutes would be great. Your assessments are also going to be less detailed. To be honest, there are not that many services you can uh, refer to. So your case management on the phone really is focused on emotional support, assessing safety and providing information, referrals and coping tactics on keeping safe. You also will have limited follow-up just because there'll be very limited survival mobility in most uh, contexts and providers may narrow service provision to the things that we mentioned before, healthcare, emotional and safety support. So it's just really important to be realistic about what you can offer during the context of COVID-19 and to make your caseworkers be aware of that. And, and to be able to sit with the discomfort of that, that's very difficult, um, knowing that your options are limited. Next slide, please. 
So one of the key important things is the introduction. So introductions follow the same process, but they are shorter. Um, and also really, they're really about establishing safety. So your introduction isn't just around um, introducing yourself, your organization, or your limits to confidentiality, et cetera, et cetera, and informed consent. They are first and foremost also about establishing is the survivor okay to speak right now? You know, and if not, um, is, there the, is there a person there who might be harming them that they're afraid of? So using close-ended yes or no questions, which is not normally what we recommend in case management, right? We're doing lots of open-ended questions, but at the beginning, establishing the safety, assessing the level of risk is really important and then providing some safety advice and assistance because some of the people who are calling you are not just survivors coming for normal case-to-case -case, um, case management uh, support, but also maybe survivors in imminent danger. So going back to what you need for prep, having those safety tips is important. And when you're planning your service, having those partnerships with either formal security services uh, where they are trusted, or informal community security services that will be working are essential. Next slide, please. Again, um, this is the next stage in terms of assessments, which we have gone through before. And again, it's about listening as much as possible and not um, cutting off the survivor story as well. But really, it's really focusing on the core emotional and um, service needs that you can provide. And it's really important to let the survivor know that upfront in terms of what is available and what is not. And in this process, unlike um, how we do in normal face-to-face -face case management, we're not really going to have like extensive documentation because the reality is because of limited follow-up and because of a lack of um, services that are available, and the fact that a lot of survivors might not call you more than once. You have to be responsible about the level of information you're documenting. But the next session will go into this in more detail. Next slide, please. So on crisis calls, um, I, within the context of COVID-19, safety planning is really, really important. In a way, it's more enhanced than what you would do in terms of um, face -to -case, uh, face to face case management. But there is like a longer uh, podcast on this on the GBV IMS website. But key principles to remember. Uh, to remind her that she knows the situation best. And this is going back to the principles that we use in crisis uh, counseling. A reminder of resilience and former solutions is really important. You know, helping her identify the safest space in her home, helping her make a plan with and for her children if it's possible, identifying the support system and resources, especially under new restrictions and making sure she has a plan in case she decides to leave and you have a referral pathway if it's possible to help her leave if those services are available. Remember the most dangerous time for a survivor is if she decides to leave. Now, there are other things that we can also discuss in terms of the COVID-19 uh, response, particularly if you're doing dignity kits uh, distributions and you can afford in procurement and get in small door, uh, door stoppers, which um, in some contexts that's possible to sort of like help a survivor block a room if she's in imminent uh, risk of um, harm and so like community support or a neighbor can support her, et cetera. But we can talk about this more in the Q&A. Next slide, please. Implementation and ending the call. So we don't skip informed consent. This is still part of the um, introduction process. Um, you know, but again, you know, it's really being realistic in this stage much more than you would be in face to face around like the limitations you have in terms of referral. But this is also a, a point, um, again, in terms of crisis um, counseling to really reassure the survivor that despite the limitations, they are not alone, to validate their feelings. And really in the last few minutes to seek to stabilize the survivor. So she's not leaving your session in a more traumatized state than you started. 
because the reality of it is that like you know after the call she's again all, all alone um she's not quite sure who can support her so given her sense of um like solidarity that you're there encouraging her to stay in touch at all if possible to bring you your service again is really important it's also about centering the survivor to look and plan and encourage her for the rest of the day to look at tips around uh, centering uh, survivors. What, can, what are you looking for today? You know, what are the things you have to do today? So trying to keep them uh, as focused as possible. And lastly, it's really important to remind a survivor to delete signs of calls from their phone. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, um, even though survivors may have access to mobile phones, it doesn't mean the use of them is easy. Um, there is um, a lot of um, a lot of surveillance possible in a situation of intimate partner violence. So, in order to to help that, it would be important to remind the survivor constantly to to delete signs of the call. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to hand over to Vivian, who's going to talk about um, aspects of working with child and adolescent survivors. Vivian, over to you. Thanks, Dorcas. Uh, Am I, uh, can everyone hear me? Um, my name is Vivian Koech. I'm child and adolescent survivor coordinator working with the GBV AOR. Um, most of the things have been touched by uh, Laura and uh, Dorcas, and uh, most of them are also still applicable when providing case management to child and adolescent survivors. And um, for my presentation, I'll focus mainly on key things that relates to working with child and adolescent survivor, especially during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic period. Um, it is important to say that uh, service providers, especially GBV and CP case workers, to adhere to guiding principles for working with child and adolescent survivors regardless of uh, the changes in service delivery modalities during this period. Um, I must also say that uh, all uh, sexual violence and GBV cases involving children and adolescents should be um, classified as high risk and should be prioritized for case management support to the extent possible. So as uh, for this um, presentation, um, I'll be looking at, uh, we'll be looking at how we are going to manage uh, cases, uh, new cases for adolescent and, ch and child survivors during this period of COVID-19. And uh, the best way is to establish uh, in-country uh, clear protocols for intake of GBV cases, look, taking into consideration um, the age and developmental stages of the children. Uh, for example, um, here we are supposed to uh, put into consideration uh, the best interest of the child. We look at uh, the care arrangements where the child is, as well as who is the child living with, as well as who are we seeking for consent from the family, because we understand that uh, on most occasions, family members are the key perpetrators of violence against children. And so during this period, uh, probably even such cases might be on the rise. And even for girls who've been uh, married off um, at an early age, and so they may be experiencing uh, intimate uh, partner violence within their families. And so uh, during, um, when establishing this kind of uh, protocols, then we need to put in, into consideration um, all these factors while also assessing um, the, the safety and security of, of the child in regards to providing support remotely. At this point, we also might have to see the visibility of uh, availability of static services and so and also this will be determined further by whether there is a restricted movement or total lockdown. So such consideration also comes in when uh, we are uh, establishing this kind of protocols. For the existing cases, 
then um, it would also be important that uh, service providers at this point uh, needs to prepare early. And so they must be able to discuss or inform um, the survivors about uh, the COVID-19, including their parents. For children, uh, we need to seek uh, consent of the parents or any trusted adult uh, in that case that uh, we, there is possibility of uh, transition to remote service delivery. And so at this point, um, there is need to have a joint uh, risk assessment with the child and the family uh, and uh, see the visibility of, um, uh, of uh, how to provide support going forward. Um, in this situation, you need to look at uh, the living conditions of the child whether there is space within the family member where the child can be able to make a call or to report uh, and also issues of confidentiality should also be put into consideration in this, um, in this situation. Uh, there is also need um, to adjust the safety plans in light of uh, COVID-19. Uh, most of the cases probably that have already been registered, some of, uh, of uh, the children uh, or um, survivors, maybe the family member was the perpetrator. And so at this point, before the enforcement of this kind of uh, measures, then there is need to see if the child can be removed entirely from that uh, care arrangement to reduce the risk of harm and also uh, discuss how they could be able to access help or how to safely access services. At this point, we also need to understand um, or to seek um, to also ex allow the children to express themselves through this process so that they may be able to express their wishes, their fears, and also to give them space to make decisions of what they think is appropriate for them. Uh, because it is them that understands uh, better their situation or the situation that they are in at this particular um, time. Also, there is need to assess the feasibility of continuing with case management uh, uh, remotely because, uh, as I said, uh, we may be able to see if check-in calls could be appropriate and feasible at this moment or um, is it possible to provide some kind of support to parents or caregivers to be able to support the children at home? So this is also uh, a stage where we need to engage further with uh, the child and, uh, and the family members that are um, living with the child. Uh, also, uh, during this, uh, we need also to discuss of any changes in the care plan, and this should also be done jointly with the child and the family members, given that uh, there could be suspension of some referrals or there could be reduced number of hours for service provision. So at this point, you need to make sure that the family understands the changes in service delivery as well as the changes in their care plans. So in all these, we need to remember to ensure there is active participation of the child in all these processes. Uh, best interest of the child is of uh, primary consideration and then uh, ensure uh, confidentiality uh, in all these processes. Thank you. Over to you, Dorcas. Oh, sorry about that. I was just trying to get unmuted. Um, so the last thing that we have to talk about, but one of the most crucial things um, is uh, safety and staff care. The reality of this is that um, crisis case management on the phone can be extremely stressful, particularly when you receive calls um, when a survivor is at imminent risk of harm. So we do have um, the GBV IMS uh, website again, like a very um, detailed um, podcast and presentation on this. 
But I think it's really important if you are a supervisor to really um, remind, remind caseworkers mostly that you really can't remember that they can't save a survivor and that the role of uh, crisis case management on the phone, as with all case management, but particularly in these circumstances, is to provide survivors with emotional support, help them think through their safety options, and connect them to others who can help them. And I think it's really important that you look at daily or regular check-ins with your caseworkers to discuss the ex uh, experiences and stresses, encouraging them to reach out for support, using self-help care tools. We have the self-help self-care inventory that's available in the interagency GBV case management guidelines. And, you know, establishing support networks like WhatsApp groups to monitor daily well-being of staff. But that's it for me for now. Um, and I look forward to answering a number of your questions, including where I think it's very popular, where survivors don't have access to mobile phones. Uh, we have some solutions for that that we can discuss. But I will now pass on to the next speaker, Caroline. Thanks, Dorcas. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Caroline Masbunji and I work with the UNICEF GBVIE team at global level and also part of the global GBVIMS technical team. Um, so I'm going to talk about confidentiality and documentation. Um, just before we start, um, as for the other speakers, uh, here we're focusing on providing remote case management services over the phone, which we understand is not the only um, modality that you can choose for service delivery in the context of the COVID-19 response. So depending obviously on the government restriction, on the restriction of your own organization, on the context, uh, health concerns, etc., you might choose a different modality that might not be, um, also because it might not be realistic, uh, for you, for your organization, um, it might not be case management, remote case management over the phone. Um, but for the purpose of this presentation, again, this is what I'm going to talk about. And um, because it's particularly uh, complicated or challenging to maintain confidentiality and documentation when you're talking about providing remote case management over the phone, um, I'm going to try to uh, break it down a little bit uh, further. Uh, before I get more into detail, I, I also want to mention to you that um, we have on the GBVIMS website, gbvims.com, um, we have developed a guidance note specifically on this topic um, that uh, enters more in detail. And we have a series of podcasts and video shorts on the topic of remote case management over the phone. Uh, next slide, please. So what does confidentiality look like in remote case management over the phone? Um, obviously, uh, when we're talking about confidentiality, we want to make sure that upon the consent of survivors, we only um, collect or gather information that are necessary um, in order to take action. Um, so there are three steps or three um, aspects um, of confidentiality. The first one um, is that we want to make sure that uh, we assess that providing case management over the phone is safe and um, confidential. In order to do that before um, organizations shift to providing um, the service over the phone, uh, supervisors or program managers need to assess that uh, the conditions are suitable. This means that um, caseworkers that are providing um, this service likely from their home um, have a minimum of privacy to provide, um, to, to have this call with survivors that their living conditions allow for this, um, for this setup. Uh, so obviously, um, and I, I saw that someone um, typed this on the, on the chat box, um, it might be much more challenging for a caseworker who's uh, living in a tent to be able to provide that service confidentially. The second point um, is that you need to have uh, obtained informed consent from survivors to provide that service over the phone. So if we're talking about um, survivors that were previously 
um, coming to your services uh, when you were providing services in center-based or um, otherwise our mobile teams, um, you need to have had that consent before you contact them when you shift to phone-based case management. Um, and every time uh, you contact survivors again over the phone, you need to be able to reassess uh, the, that consent is still there. Um, and especially for survivors of intimate partner violence um, that are uh, living with their abusers, uh, this is particularly important to also assess their safety. Um, and finally, you need to make sure that you have a safe and confidential storage of the information that you're collecting. Um, and we're going to see this now. Next slide, please. So what should be documented by caseworkers when you're providing um, remote case management over the phone? First of all, uh, because of the sensitivity of the information that you're collecting and the fact that um, collecting uh, information on papers from survivors' home is never safe and is never recommended. Um, the advice uh, is to not store paper files at home. Um, so this is, this is important in terms of maintaining the confidentiality. And um, to receive verbal consent from survivors when conducting case management. However, there is a number of um, of things that you can do um, in order to collect that information. So um, there is uh, new technologies that you can use. Um, so the GBVIMS steering committee has developed a new uh, generation of the GBVIMS called Primero GBVIMS Plus. That is a, an online and offline uh, digital case management tool that allows you to collect information either online uh, connecting on uh, a web platform or um, offline uh, through a mobile application. Uh, this is particularly safe because um, especially when um, data or information is collected on a mobile application, um, there is the possibility to wipe uh, data remotely in case the phone, the phone or mobile device, the tablet is, is uh, stolen or, or lost, um, or that we feel that the data might have been compromised. So this is a way that you can continue to store data uh, or document data on phone-based case management um, if needed. Um, then, of course, um, each organization will need to outweigh uh, risks versus benefits of documenting cases. Um, we don't know how long the, the, the situation is going to last. Uh, it might last for a few weeks or months. So obviously, um, there, there might be a need to um, do some level of documentation uh, for caseworkers, and each organization here will need to decide what feels safe for them. Um, in this uh, regard, um, each organization should consult their technical advisor internally or can also reach out to the GBVIMS global team. Um, and I'm going to type the email address on the chat box. Um, then, in order to record uh, phone numbers of survivors, uh, we recommend that uh, caseworkers use survivors' codes. Um, so there is a specific coding system um, for that we have for the GBVIMS, and you can check it out on our website um, in order to use uh, names. Um, as much as possible, names should not be, uh, or names connecting um, to the survivor's code should not be written down. If needed, they could be stored um, on, um, on a caseworker's desktop with a password um, with a, with a password um, or alternatively on, on paper file, but it's not recommended if there is a way to put it in a locked cabinet. For hotline specifically, uh, we want to know what um, you need to, to make sure um, that within your organization, you know what information you're going to collect and make sure that this is the minimum information needed, how you're going to store it, how consent will be taken um, as part of the um, calls with uh, survivors and to have clear protocols on um, data collection. Next slide, please. So in terms of data protection, what should be in place within your organization? Um, you should have a data protection protocol, um, even 
outside of this situation. Um, we have a template and a checklist on the GBVIMS website that you can check out. Um, we need to, or your organization needs to know how you're going to deal with existing case files that you might have stored either in a safe space or in an office. Um, if you're not going to be able to access them for a few weeks or a few months, are they safe or do you need to move them? If you need to move them, um, have you allocated clear roles and responsibilities for each staff to know uh, who is going to access the center, how are they going to access it, how are they going to um, use the, the um, or to destroy the files if needed or move them, etc. Um, and this data protection protocol can be revised uh, for COVID-19 response specifically um, in order to match the modality of service provision that you're going to go with. Um, and also, um, it is recommended, especially if you're conducting uh, case management over the phone, uh, to ask staff to sign a data protection agreement that should be specifically adapted for this. Next slide, please. So if you're using the GBV IMS, um, what does that mean if you're shifting your service delivery in the context of COVID-19? So obviously there is um, a number of um, scenarios for your organization or for organizations to how they're going to provide services in this context. If you're going to stop service provision altogether because it's not assessed, assessed uh, safe or possible for your organization, um, or if you're going to shift um, service provision to other modalities, which means likely that you might receive less cases or um, that it might uh, have an implication on your caseload, uh, we do uh, recommend that you inform your GBVIMS interagency coordinator at country level um, in order for them to know that either you're stopping service provision or that the caseload might change and that will affect the trends. Um, second, um, you could consider using the emergency intake form instead of the regular intake form, which is much more reduced, um, which, which is likely to be the information that you will collect from callers if you're providing case management over the phones as it's reduced as Dorcas outlined in terms of the process. Um, however, only uh, consider this if you're, you have a plan for analyzing this data. It's not just to collect information. Um, then you also need to consider um, potentially whether um, rolling out Primero GBV IMS Plus um, could be applicable for you. The GBV IMS Global Team can support in, um, in a rapid rollout of, of this um, and especially the mobile application that might, might be particularly relevant in this context to collect information. Um, also consider how compilation will work. Um, if caseworkers are um, collecting information from their homes um, without, or without or with limited internet connection, how are they going to send their incident recorder or line data to their focal point at the organizational level? Can it be done over the phone? Is it safe to do it over the phone? Um, or um, is there a particularly challenging uh, context in which compilation cannot happen, which means that data sharing at the interagency level will not happen. Um, so here in your information sharing protocol at country level, you should have planned um, what to do in terms of uh, if, if, service, if there is an emergency. So um, you might need to revise this information sharing protocol to adapt it to the context or not, depending on what it says. Um, also, if you're able to go forward with the analysis and the data sharing at interagency level as usual, um, when analyzing data at interagency level or within your organization, we do recommend that you pay special attention to trends related to intimate partner violence and access to services for survivors as they're likely to be affected in this context and it would be good to be able to have that analysis and that um, advocacy there. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you for our resource persons. I'm Pamela Marie Godoy, GBVAOR Asia and the Pacific. 
So moving on to specific considerations for GBV subclusters and coordinators, one of the key functions of the GBV subcluster is to support service delivery to ensure that GBV survivors have access to life-saving care and support in a safe, timely, and confidential manner. Field colleagues have been engaged in the process of monitoring functionality of referral systems and addressing barriers for survivors in accessing services. And in the past, field colleagues have done a reassessment and updating of referral pathways, which is suggested in any case to be every six months at the minimum by the interagency minimum standards for gender-based violence in emergency programming. In most, if not all contexts, a GBV referral pathway already exists, but depending on the country level strategies that are being implemented to contain the spread of COVID-19, such as mobility restrictions, partial or complete lockdown, shelter in place, or stay at home orders, there needs to be a review on whether existing services prior to the COVID-19 pandemic are still operational. Will they continue to function or not? what services can shift from face-to-face -to, -face to remote service delivery, and what new services can be made available. Further to the technical guidance note on women and girls safe spaces that was jointly released by IRC, IMC, and Norwegian Church Aid, safe spaces for women and girls should remain open as long as possible, and activities should be adjusted to the risk realities of different country contexts. Can the safe space be redesigned to avoid congestion? Can the size of group activities be limited to comply with social distancing measures? Plans should be established for implementing further restrictions and reducing activities to one-on-one -on -one should risk increase. If the safe space need to be closed temporarily, can existing network of community-based grassroots organizations act as entry points for reporting and link survivors to appropriate services. In the case of medical and healthcare, in all emergency contexts, particularly in the acute phase where sexual violence and intimate partner violence are prevalent, health is the priority service. Due to its immediate, time-sensitive and potentially life-threatening health consequences, addressing sexual violence is critical and ensuring clinical management of rape is imperative. And this has been emphasized by the World Health Organization in our April 2 webinar on ensuring continuity of essential health services for GBV survivors during the COVID-19 crisis. For legal assistance, are mechanisms in place for legal aid to continue? For instance, is there remote legal assistance, remote proceedings, or even remote renewal of protection orders? For shelters and safe havens, can partnership be established with hotels and dormitories to provide temporary shelters to domestic violence survivors? Um, for instance, we have heard that the largest chains of hotels, Accor, is sheltering women who are fleeing from their abusive partnerships. Uh, so this is something that we can uh, explore. Here is an example of an updated GBV referral pathway for women and children survivors from Fiji in the COVID-19 response context. This is a product of interagency work among UNFPA, UN Women, and UNICEF in close collaboration with the Ministry of Women, Children, and Poverty, and the Ministry of Health. This is a highly targeted referral pathway for dissemination to health sector with an accompanying interagency training package and deep sheets for health workers. The World Health Organization is involved in the training and dissemination of this pathway. Health workers will be trained on how to look out for the signs and symptoms, which would lead to a suspicion of violence, and then provide the right information and referral to healthcare workers who are trained on clinical management of rape and responding to IPV survivors. This is another example from the RC. Kinshasa, Kinshasa is not a humanitarian hotspot and it did not have an existing uh, GBV referral pathway even though there are available services. Given the COVID-19 crisis, the referral pathway was prepared, taking into account remote services and putting in place protective measures for service providers and survivors who are accessing the one-stop crisis centers. 
What is unique with Kinshasa is the presence of a functioning helpline, which is the red number there. For now, the updated referral pathway is only distributed electronically uh, to partners. The next example is a referral pathway from Burundi. This has been revised and updated based on the COVID-19 crisis. Please note that in Burundi, there are no social dis distancing measures or home confinement yet. Um, the first page, which is on your left side, the hotline numbers, one hotline is dedicated for child protection and the other one is for all cases of violence. If you can see the visuals were used to make it more understandable. The key messages on the right side are outlined uh, and they're extracted from the GBV packet guide. The approval of this uh, pathway is pending with the Ministry of Women and Social Affairs. Uh, this referral pathway will be printed out and laminated for distribution. So just to summarize, rapid mapping had, has to be done. The methodology will vary by context. Will visual observations still be possible without putting yourself or others at risk? For other contexts, information collection may be done remotely by phone, online internet platforms when available. Uh, if it's feasible, can virtual focus group discussions with GBV caseworkers be conducted? The five W's can be modified to include questions on movement restrictions, curfews, staff reduction, and even changes in schedule. To inform communities about the referral pathway, it has been our good practice to engage local women's rights organizations, community-based health workers, organizations of persons with disabilities, community first aid responders, and Red Cross, Red Crescent volunteers. Given the fluidity of the COVID-19 context, there needs to be close monitoring of the referral pathway to ensure that all information is up to date. In terms of dissemination, various channels um, need to be explored depending on the best ac access for the women and girls and communities. Consider relaying through local radio stations and maximizing technology such as SMS, Facebook, or WhatsApp. In country contexts where GBV and child protection actors have an operational presence and are supporting child and adolescent survivors, it is recommended that they closely coordinate to discuss any adaptation needed to existing protocols or procedures relating to addressing the specific needs of child and adolescent survivors. Ensure that frontline staff and volunteers are trained on psychological first aid and how to relay information on available services. Our go-to reference is the GBV packet guide. And lastly, um, strategize and advocate for case management services so that the funding and the resources do not shrink for response scale of services once the COVID-19 related restrictions are removed. So the resources uh, and the links will be posted uh, in the chat window by Lee Ashley and Jessica. We can now move on to the question and answer uh, open forum. So over to you, Jessica and Lee Ashley. Thank you, Pam. Um, a big thank you to all of our speakers, because I think this is one of our most practical webinars with all these great information that's being provided um, on how we can, in fact, do remote case management. We had a lot of questions in the chat, so I will um, ask a few, and then I'll have uh, our colleague Leah Ashley will ask a couple as well. We've kind of grouped some of the questions together because many of you had similar questions. They might not be exactly the same, but I think we're similar in context. So I will ask two questions. And the first one is, do you have examples of SOPs for case management? And this specifically was mentioned by Laura and also similarly in terms of safety planning resources. So we had lots of questions about SOPs for case management, and then lots of questions about safety planning resources. And then the second question, and I think it was either Caroline or Dorcas probably anticipated this one. It's about where, how we do remote case management when we don't have mobile phones 
or in places or households where there's no access to those resources, maybe because of the power dynamics in the home. And they also mention, for instance, children who probably won't have a confidential means of accessing a cell phone. So first question is about resources, specifically for SOPs and case management and safety planning. And then the second is about remote case management where you do not have mobile phone access, whether it's because there's no network or in fact, we can't just, they can't access due to power dynamics. So maybe Laura, you could start with the first one with the SOPs. I think we might have to unmute. Or if anybody else, any of our other speakers would like to. Okay, sorry, I can, okay. Go ahead. I can speak now, okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, okay, for so for the SOP, obviously, uh, I, I'm not aware of a specific model for the uh, the case of SOP for the COVID-19 context, obviously, just because it's a very new context, obviously, right? Plus, um, the the modalities of work can be diff very different from organization to organization. Here in this case, we're talking about internal organization SOP, right? So we usually talk about SOP at interagency level when we talk about SOP with the subcluster and so on, and that's and that's something different. In this case, we're talking specifically about case management uh, within your organization. So. Um, it's an internal document, right? You can call it SOP. In some cases, some people might call it, uh, you know, uh, internal internal uh, documentation or in other ways. But anyway, it's a document that describes the way you, your organization, are doing remote case management during COVID-19. So in this case, um, I know that many organizations, of course, in their own countries are working on this internal document to try to adapt uh, uh, the usual case management process to this specific context. So we discussed uh, briefly, very briefly, of course, in this presentation, the, the, the topic we might want to include in this SOP. But when it comes in terms of contents, and again, if you want to go again through the five, uh, six, seven, I think, topics we suggested to put in the SOP, uh, they were not on the PowerPoint, but if you go and listen to uh, the podcast, uh, in the podcast, uh, in the audio of the podcast, we will, uh, you know, we are talking about those those points again. So you can go back there and if you want to take down notes. But in the terms of the details of the contents of that SOP, um, you can check with other organization in your specific context, but I believe it's something that has to be very tailored on your own organization because the way you provide uh, uh, the remote case management is from, if from the home of your of your staff, uh, or if uh, using still the women and girls safe spaces uh, for the case manager to be based or so on, it can be very, very different from organization to organization. Um, I think the best way at this point, considering everyone is trying to adapt their own uh, process and their own service provision to this new context, let's say, um, it's to uh, look at the, the main points, so the main chapters, let's call them like that, that you want to make sure to include, which of course are uh, those we mentioned before uh, in the presentation and uh, many more because you can go in more detail discussing also about the way uh, of uh, providing, uh, dealing with the risk cases and so on. But it's something that uh, following the general guidance and the general best practice that we just discussed, I think it's something that for some of the issues at least must be really, really be tailored for your own organization. So um, yeah, uh, for SOP specific, so long story short, SOP internal organization, SOP specifically for the COVID response. So shifting to remote case management due to the COVID situation. I'm not aware of anything out there publicly available just because it's a very new topic, of course. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if other colleagues have something to share or are aware of someone who puts that kind of documentation publicly uh, available. But I think with all the webinars we have about case management available now, webinars, podcasts, uh, 
uh, on the GBVIMS uh, website, uh, you know, starting from those best practices, uh, you can put them in your own SOP, adapting to your own context and your own situation of your own countries, I believe. So that could be a definite right. starting point. Sorry, I was okay. A bit Thank you for that. And I saw in the chat that um, UNHCR does have a SOPs for remote case management, and I'm guessing they're probably a template for that. So that might be a resource people might want to, in their countries, maybe to um, have a discussion with their UNHCR colleagues. Um, and then maybe we can shift over to either Dorcas or Caroline about the question related to where we don't have mobile phones uh, because due to access or the network. And uh, I think someone had mentioned you might have some, okay, Dorcas. And can somebody, uh, Shiva or Stephanie, can you unmute or yeah, unmute Dorcas, please. Oh, hi, yes, that's the hot topic of the day. Um, and we actually um, have produced some guidance on a podcast that will probably come out um, next week, Monday or Tuesday. But um, in brief, um, you know, uh, in high income countries, they're sort of doing GBV integration in pharmacies and in um, in supermarkets, basically where any, any place that, um, that women are permitted to circulate. But well, we've um, actually put together um, a bit of more detailed guidance on what you can do within humanitarian settings and low income settings where these kind of like entry points won't be possible. So I can't speak to too much about the detail, but I can tell you a little bit about the sort of like things that you must be looking at in terms of where, in terms of like adapting existing uh, physical spaces. So one organization in Northeast Nigeria has actually um, adapted their physical women and girls spaces into GBV phone booths, which, um, and this all depends on whether you can have like a, um, a sense of uh, movement, if women are allowed to move around. And those uh, phone booths in the women and girls safe spaces are sort of, um, managed by uh, GBV caseworkers and only five women at a time can go and they've sort of like matched the time with like when there might be food distributions um, in the camp so that it doesn't look like the women are going um, and doing something out of the ordinary. But these also all depend, those solutions, which you still use physical spaces, as it were, depend on like getting permissions to operate in some form. Then there are like what we call creating non low tech um, signal alert systems. So we've talked to a number of like local women's rights organizations in very remote parts of the world or uh, women human rights defenders who have to sort of alert people that they're in danger and the methodology that they use. So the paper goes through that. I mean, it gives you like tips around like the conditions and resources that you need. And then also we look at some of you are mentioning that like, you know, okay, making the call is the problem, but there are other kind of app solutions that you can use. Um, so if you are in a context where women can use mobile phones and the thing is more around like the safety of making a call, there are all sorts of apps. There's an Indian app called Chilla, which um, for example, works, you know, um, it um, sends an alert to five pre-programmed contacts that you might have, which might be a GBV service provider or your neighbor, or if you, the police are trusted in your context. If it hear, hears the screen, it sends that alert. So it's good for women in situations of um, high crisis. There are also other high-tech solutions, which are actually cheaper than mobile phones. Um, which have become like a kind of a sophisticated way of using uh, panic alarms, which also send um, alerts around, which can be procured instead of like maybe um, adapting in terms of expense certain physical spaces. But there are sort of low tech solutions or no tech solutions that we have um, pioneered. Sorry I'm, that I missed the words as a question. It's Chilla. The, the app is called Chilla, but there are lots of other apps. There are apps that like if you shake your phone, it sends an alert. If you press the off, um, off button five times, it sends an alert. 
and they don't all need to work on smartphones. They are sort of GPS trackers um, that um, have been pioneered by security firms in um, high risk environments, but are now quite cheap on the market. Um, but then there are other real low tech or no tech solutions as well. But we'll go into this in more detail next week. Uh, when we send out uh, the, uh, the guidance. There's limited time to talk now and, and more questions. But just to reassure you, there are a number of solutions that we thought through for different contexts and different resources. Okay. Great, thank you so much. And I think before I turn over to Leah Ashley, we just also have to realize that with remote case management, there are always going to be limitations. And so we're not gonna meet every need um, through this modality and sometimes we don't actually have answers to your questions because it might just be impossible to to provide as we say remote case management in some contexts or in some situations so also know that remote uh, case management is not universal and I think we had some good examples of ways we can kind of work around that I'll turn over to Leah Ashley I know we're running on time and she had a few more questions for our presenters Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, the first question I have is really open to any of the panelists, but perhaps Vivian and Dorcas and Caroline, you might um, be the first ones to answer. There was discussion in the chat about how do we tailor case management services to specific groups in this context, particularly persons with disabilities and how they may access remote services as well as LGBTI communities and male survivors. Over to the panel. We might have to unmute. Let's see. Stephanie, can we unmute Dorcas and or Caroline? Dorcas, you're unmuted. I am, I am. I was, I was, <laughs> you're I was like, oh, the hot seat. <laughs> um, so like I, I saw some of the questions and Caroline is also going to help me. So um, the, really the same principles apply given that we're talking about this in terms of uh, phone-based uh, uh, case management. The issue is of course around um, disability and when um, people with disabilities can't use uh, the phone and that's where I think that some of our non-phone-based uh, case management solutions are more suitable for people, for people with disabilities that that have um, have that that situation, but um, remember, really, this is like this is not like something necessarily new in terms of our case management process. It's just like truncated. So we're trying to do pretty much the same and um, be survivor centered. Um, and aware of all the different intersections of people who are calling um, calling us, but the, it's a truncated process. It's not necessarily a different process. But I do take the point uh, definitely around uh, people with uh, disabilities that physically using the phone make difference. I think that the sort of non-phone based solutions that we're thinking through might be um, might be useful. I don't know if Caroline, you want to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Dorcas. Um, no, I, I think I absolutely agree with you. I mean, for, for persons with disabilities, definitely uh, consider physical disabilities. And the answer to that might change a lot depending on the on your context, of course, but also depending on the setup of your of your of your programming of your service provision. Like, are you providing phone based case management from caseworkers' homes or from an office or our health center? Um, do you have some sort of face-to-face -face that is possible depending on your gov the government restrictions, your organization's policy, the um, uh, context in terms of um, uh, like the, in terms of um, uh, health and safety? 
So it's really hard to uh, give a, a general recommendation, but I would say though that the um, same uh, guidance that are included in the case management guidelines released in 2017, when it comes to um, LGBTQ uh, and uh, person with disabilities would apply in the context of phone-based case management with the principles that we have uh, outlined uh, throughout this webinar. Great, thank you. And um, yes, uh, we will post the interagency case management guideline link in the chat so everyone can review that resource. I have a similar question that will relate to that. There was a lot of interest um, in your discussion about the intake form and several people would like to know if you recommend uh, adapting the intake form specifically for the COVID-19 crisis. And I'll probably direct that to Caroline first, but uh, please others uh, let us know if you'd like to respond as well. Yes, sure, sorry, I um, was trying to unmute. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. So I think uh, when you're considering um, shifting to, um, to, to an emergency intake form, as I mentioned, um, first of all, like the, the prerequisite is really to consider whether uh, you can do that in a way that is uh, safe in terms of documentation. So, I mean, I'm not going to repeat what I outlined during the um, during my presentation, but we don't recommend you to co to collect information on paper. So, unless you have a way to do that digitally, um, it's not great. You could also consider, um, you know, having um, a case management, uh, sorry, a GBVIMS focal point, gathering this information over the phone by contacting. Uh, caseworkers and just collecting that information in an in an Excel based incident recorder. Um, so the emergency intake form essentially you can you can check out um, uh, our sample the sample on, on our uh, website um, is a reduced version of your of the um, uh, full intake form that we usually have. Um, it's one page, um, I think it's just one page, um, and it kind of follows the information that we think you're likely to be collecting from callers during a reduced version of your case management process. So obviously the case management over the phone is going to look very different than a full-fledged case management face-to-face, uh, -face. and the information that you're going to receive from callers, from survivors over the phone, is um, easily compiled into this emergency intake form. Again, your organization will have to make a decision on whether to use this emergency intake form based on the capacity to store that information safely and confidentially, but also um, to make sure that you also have a plan on how you want to analyze that information. The emergency intake form is not needed for your case management process. For your case management process, you need to have case management forms or to follow your um, the, the usual um, um, documentation process you have for the purpose of collecting information for your case management. The emergency intake form, what it will do is to collect a set of information about the survivor, about the perpetrator and the incident in order to be able to generate analysis. Um, so unless you have a plan to analyze that information, do not collect, do not uh, use an emergency intake form. Thank you, Carolyn. Would any, would any of our other panelists like to respond further? Okay, I'll take that um, to bring us to the end today. It's 4.57, um, so we're near the end of our webinar. It has been such a pleasure for us all to be here today. Um, and I want to really thank all of our panelists. You have provided us with so much practical guidance as well as really brought us home to our core principles uh, for uh, ensuring that we keep the safety and confidentiality and informed consent always present, even in the COVID-19 response. So thank you very much. Um, I would like ev to encourage everyone to please
please complete the post webinar survey, which we will have in the chat room in a moment, as well as will be available on the GBV AOR website. Um, and we would also like to thank every week um, our colleagues at the GBV AOR help desk, as well as um, our colleagues at the community of practice. And we encourage everyone to continue to use those resources. And we will be updating um, the webinar recording and other information that we shared today there as well. So with that, I think I will take a moment just to say stay safe and stay well. And we hope to see you back here yeah. next week for our webinar and we'll be discussing engaging with communities. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye.